Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm really glad you're here. We have our special guest, Midge Rosebrook, with us tonight, who I'm sure is a very familiar face to you if you're a regular viewer of this podcast, and he has a big announcement for us. Take it away, Midge. Yes, Mike. Uh, as everybody knows, this is uh, induction time for us, and the way the summer's been, uh, we can't count on any weekend now to, to have a decent weekend without rain. And so I think, uh, what, Mike, we might have had two weekends all summer, Saturday and Sunday, that it were rain-free, maybe two, yeah. maybe three. And just to have so, two days in a row without rain was something. Yeah. But, but go ahead. So with that, I decided to find out if we could rent one of the barns up to the fairgrounds. And Ed Sampson, who is uh, right on board with our Hall of Fame, he was right on board with our Grand Prix, the 50th reunion, and uh, he's, a, he's a great friend of this organization, and he is also the president of the fairgrounds, of the Fairground Association. And he gladly is allowing us to use the commercial hall what they call the mall. They also call it the mall, but it's the commercial hall. And if anybody's familiar with the Lancaster Fair, it's that big, huge building where you walk through one side and you have vendors on both sides. And then you go outside and go through the other door and you walk down with vendors on both sides on, on that side as well. And they split the middle with a, with a great big uh, uh, border of lattice work. So that all, I had to take that down Wednesday and I swept the whole place and got it ready. Today, my wife, Glinda, and I went down and, and put those chairs in and the, put the banner up on the wall. Got the sound system somewhat hooked up. Mike said he's going to give us a hand on that. And we're pretty basically ready for this. So Saturday at one o'clock or thereafter, at the fairgrounds, we're going to have the seventh Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame this year. We're, we're inducting five more pioneers of the golden era. And so uh, then the after party is not going to be at the motel, unfortunately, this year. The cost is, is, is skyrocketing. Paul Crane, if, if anybody out there wants to know... Uh, how good Paul Crane is at watching the dollars for this organization. This is it because he is paying for a caterer. It's not going to be at the motel. It's going to be at the museum. So after we do our induction at the fairgrounds undercover, we're going to have everyone, uh, all the inductees and their families go down to the museum for the unveiling of their plaques on the wall. We're going to do that. We'll pull the pins and the cloth drops, and they can take photos and everything at that point there. And then we will have a small luncheon in the museum uh, just for the inductees, like we always have done. Only just this year, it's not going to be at the motel, unfortunately. But the motel is inviting the inductees and their families down to the motel after that's taken care of for drinks and camaraderie and fellowship and just hanging out and, uh, and basically winding down from the day, you know? Sure. And that is so, a great place for that. Yes, it is. Yeah. And since the motel is good friends of ours, we're going to give them a shameless plug. The Lancaster motel. They've always been very good to both yeah. the Eastern snowmobile racing hall of fame, as well as to this podcast. So we want to be sure and give them some love and give them a shout out. Anybody that ever raced at the Lancaster Grand Prix back in the day, 50 years ago, uh, know that the Lancaster Motel was the was the place to be uh, to stay in Lancaster and to also go back and uh, and celebrate their winning or their losses, uh, depending on what it is. But they have a beautiful bar there. They have. Uh, uh, every uh, and all the drinks available and uh, just a great place to simmer down, wind down and uh, and just uh, we'll uh, have a visit and, uh, and just, uh, you know, 
It's just going to be a quite a hectic day. It's going to be a very emotional day. So it is, yeah. as it always is. It's a wonderful way to celebrate all of those wonders, wonderful racers of yesteryear. Yes. Um, and the nice thing about it too is just um, not only with these inductees who will be inducted this year be coming, but inductees from previous years they come every year too because it's such a wonderful gathering. It's a kind of a reunion atmosphere. Yes, and that's one of the byproducts of this that maybe none of us had expected is that, that this would become kind of the the place for this whole community to gather and and spend time together. It's exactly, to be, yeah, to be friends with all of these these racers that we all um, looked up to back in the day, yeah. and to be friends with them and spend time with them, hang hang out with them. Yeah, in fact, let me do. Let me let some well, of these. It's like a big family too. back then, Mike. Yes, uh, and these well, guys race about together. That, they raced together every weekend for 10 years, uh, swap paint, and, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and these images on the screen are all legendary racers of yesteryear. Yes. Um, and they all gather at this event every year. Yes. Uh, and those smiles on these faces are genuine smiles from the yeah. heart. Yeah. Uh, because it is a wonderful time. Yeah, it's like a family reunion. It's all I can think of. These guys hadn't seen a lot of a lot of them hadn't seen each other for fifty years. Yes. When they stopped racing, they went back to their day jobs, and uh, a lot, you know, fell out of contact with a lot of the fellow racers that they saw every single weekend. So it was like, wow, you know, how you doing? And uh, you know, how you been? And they and they they've got pictures of grandkids now and. Uh, it's a, it's a great, it's a great deal. And everybody's, everybody's got a smile on their face the whole weekend. Yes. Ear to ear. Oh, and it, yeah. it's wonderful that 50 plus years later that people are remembering this and still celebrating it and gathering and that there's a place to gather for this. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, we, uh, we're going to continue it. Uh, we're going to cook that, kick that football down the road as, uh, as far as we can. And, uh, and get the correct people on the wall. And uh, basically, because uh, the racing pretty much stopped in New England, what, Mike, in the 80s maybe? Yes. Early, early mid-80s, 80s, 80s. it pretty much yes. stopped. So at some point, our Eastern racers, uh, you know, will we'll have the wall pretty well completed, I'm guessing, within the next uh, two or three years maybe. Yes. Uh, and I may be and, wrong at that, but uh, I think it's going to start winding down. We may not be doing five every year. We may do like two every year. Sure. But as I told Mike, uh, just we were talking off camera a few times. I will I will still, and if Paul, I think, still wants to do these gatherings each year, whether we induct people or not, just to have everybody come back, uh, enjoy the day. And uh, you know, and mingle, and and uh, and have fellowship with the people that they used to race against, and you know, the friendly competition. And, and now, like I say, it's just it's like a family. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. I think the fellowship is as big an attraction as the ceremony is itself. Yeah. Just looking yes, forward to seeing good. certain ones. You know, that we're going to see them in, in a few days. To me, is very exciting. There's a lot of friends I'm looking forward to seeing. Absolutely. The friends that I've made through this Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame yeah. ceremony every year. The friends that I've made. And now uh, uh, unfortunately, because as you know, these, these folks are up into their 80s now. And we lost a couple of, of, our, uh, of our members of this Hall of Fame. Uh, Bob Clark and Bruce Dunham. Yes, here's Bruce and Dunham. There's a photo of Bruce right there. Yeah, Bruce yeah. Was, uh, was one of the greatest... Uh, racers of that era there was no bigger name than bruce dunham i think he was uh, in the top two percent of the highest paid snowmobile races in the country at one time uh he, he uh, arctic cat uh, sent him a four-cylinder king cat kawasaki and he kind of campaigned that in 1971 he left timberlands he was racing skidoo but arctic cat uh, got him away from Skidoo and got him on an Cat because of his talent. Hmm. Basically, he was one of the best. And uh, he, st he was without a cat for one year, and then he went back to Skidoo. Yeah. Uh, his heart was, was with Skidoo. 
Sure. But uh, the great Bruce Dunham, yeah, he won. Uh, he's won the Kilkenny Cup uh, three different years in a row, which nobody else has done. Uh, they've we've got a couple that might have won it uh, uh, twice in a row or something like that, but Bruce Dunham has won it uh, three different times. So we won it uh, twice in a row once, and then once, uh, uh, I think, a year apart. But uh, he was uh, uh, an amazing talent, and he was an amazing friend. We're going to miss him deeply. Uh, He and his wife, Mary, are some of the two of the nicest, nicest people that you would ever want to meet. Yes, Uh, I would have to agree. And I'm, I'm glad I had a chance to visit with him last year at the ceremony that actually that day he was sitting right there when I visited with him last year. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This picture must've taken either just before or after I, I had a visit with him. Yeah. Everybody loved Bruce. Uh, not a, I've never heard a bad word said about Bruce Dunham by any of his competitors. Hmm. Yeah. He's just a wonderful, wonderful man. Yes. Yeah. And, sure. uh, and Bob Clark, I don't know if you have a photo of Bob, but I don't sadly. Uh, Bob Bob was uh, he was a charter member of the Lancaster Snowdrifters, which is the oldest uh, snowmobile club in America. And uh, he and Paul Crane and a bunch of those young fellows back in 1962 put on the very first snowmobile race in New England, probably I don't know if North America, but at least in New England in 1962 and then they did it again in 63 and then of course they call it the grand prix by 64 and bob was always heavily involved in that and uh and and bob was a dear dear friend of glinders and i and and his wife muriel and uh can't say enough good bob he he did more by accident for this for this hall of fame that we put on the 50th reunion than uh, anybody else would would do in a week sure uh he was he was heavily involved in that and uh i don't think it would have happened without bob's help really his expertise in that was just phenomenal so uh and he uh he started as a as a mechanic he was a mechanic on mac trucks at roberts motors here in town and uh uh, one of the salesmen from Harrington King one day, they sold Polaris, was a Polaris distributor in Massachusetts, and they'd been watching Bob, and uh, they they sent a salesman up one day, and Bob was on a creeper under a Mack truck, and guy says, uh, Bob Clark? He says, yeah, who wants me? And uh, he says, uh, my name is Ken Russell, and I'm a salesman from Harrington King. We, we, uh, we think you might make a good salesman for us. Bob slid the creeper out from under the Mack truck. And he looked up and he says, what? He says, I'm no salesman. I'm a mechanic. Well, guess what? Bob Clark never looked back. Bob Clark became a salesman for Harrington King, a salesman for Nelson and Small. And when he retired, he was the the head sales representative from Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and all of upstate New York for Polaris Industries. Wow. Yeah. And he slid out from then under there and said, I'm a mechanic, not a salesperson. Yeah, yeah he, <laughs> he, he got rid of the grease. And put, on the the tie, sales. put on the tie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately for me, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I still had the blue uniform for the next 50 years. But sure. Yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah. No, Bob was a good guy. But uh, yeah. yeah, so and then uh, and then Deb Kais, of course, from New York. We didn't yeah. know Deb very well, but she's a Kilkenny Cup winner, and we lost Deb Kais last winter. So a lot this last spring. So yeah, sure. three, three of them already. Yeah, big loss for sure. And in case people are just joining us, what we're talking about right now is the upcoming induction ceremony for the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame coming up this Saturday, September 9th. At 1 p.m., it was going to be a Crane Snowmobile Museum, but uh, due to the impending rain, we're going to have it at uh, at the Lancaster Fairgrounds in the, yeah. the commercial hall. I think you said. Yes. And, yes. Uh, so that's that's why we called you here today to uh, announce that. I'll have a sign out front. Uh, uh, the be the gate will be open, 
and uh, I'll have a sign out front and uh, there'll be a couple other little signs to look for as you travel down the road and it'll point you right to where you need to go. Perfect. So then it'll be plenty of parking. Sure. So. Now in a few minutes, we're going to play an interview that you and I did a few years ago, talking about the kind of the backstory, the origins of the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame. But before we do that, I want to give a shout out to your friend and mine, Elaine LaRiviere. All of these images we've been looking at are images that she's taken. And we've got a little montage of those images set to music that I'm going to play here. And you're going to see a lot of smiling faces in this montage. These, these images are all from last year's induction ceremony. Just to whet your appetite, uh, if you decide to join us, you could be among those smiling faces this year. So let me cue up that video. And uh, we'll take a look. These are images from last year set to music. I'm going to turn the music down in case you want to make comments, Midge, while we're looking at these images, because we've got two or three minutes to go of these, this image montage. Any, any comments that come to mind as we're viewing this? Great memories. Yeah. Great memories of, uh, of, uh, meeting Jim soul. And, uh, there's, uh, there's Lois Lund. Hopefully Lois will be back this year. And, uh, JR is not going to be able to make it, but. Oh, he's uh, not. Oh no. No, he, uh, he's having a granddaughter who's in the service. She's uh, being promoted, I think. And so they're going to have a ceremony. Wow. So he has to be there. I told him, you know, that the uh, grandkids come first. So Sure, that's the air told you right there on the left. Yeah, yeah. He likes to come every year because he's, yeah. a, he's a member of the Hall of Fame, of course. Yes. Yeah. That's Marilyn Crane right there. Yeah. Yeah. Bellwood and Elaine. Yeah, Elaine. Yeah. These are all legendary racers from yesteryear. Oh, very much so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
And this was the party the night before at the Lancaster Motel. See, I didn't get to see that, so. <laughs> Some familiar faces right there. Yeah, this was, yeah. <laughs> that Chip Elwood, Paul Lamontang. Don't know who those other two guys are. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And this is outside in front of Cranes? Yes. That's at the motel. Yeah. Tell me they aren't having a good time at that motel, Mike. Oh, for sure. Those smiles are ear to ear. Yeah. And that's the that's nice true. thing. I hope you decide to come and join us because you could be smiling ear to ear with us. Because it really is a good time hanging out with these legendary Absolutely. racers. Jim Saul right there in the big cowboy hat. Yes. And I think yeah. those were family members of his. Yes. Yeah. The Flying Farmer. Yes. Yeah, just such a good time. Yeah, great memories. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and while we're looking at this, too, I'm going to attempt to live stream the ceremony. Um, I've got a new phone. It's also a new location, so I'm not sure about whether or not I'll get a signal, but I'm going to try, and I'm going to try to do a test. I'm going to get there early so I can do a test to make sure that, uh, that we can connect. Uh, yeah. If not, I'll just record it with my cell phone and upload it a day or two later. Uh, so we can, at the very least, enjoy it a day or two later. But hopefully, I'll be able to live stream it. Yeah, and, that'd uh, be wonderful if you could, Mike. I'm, I'm thinking that the fairgrounds may have Wi-Fi up there, but I'm not sure about that. That would be great. And I know Bruce is working on trying to get a, a Wi-Fi signal as well. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be great. That's the great Herb Yancey. Yes. And Russ Swenton behind him. Yes, Russ Swenton. Yeah. He's our historian. Yes. Yeah. That's Paul. Yeah. Paul and somebody else. Yes. Don't know who that guy is. <laughs> There's one of the great uh, ma team managers in Eastern yes. history, if not all of racing history, right there in the center of the yes. screen with his yeah. lovely wife, Kathy. The label. Yeah. Yes. Do, do we know if they're coming this year? I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure about that. I'd like okay. to see him again. I sure would too. Yeah. Yeah. And Herbie Ancy and Yeah. Yeah, Herb was on his team. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do we know if Herb is coming? I believe Herb is coming. Oh good. Good. Yes. Ron Hall and the misses. Ron, I think they're coming. Good, really nice couple. They are very nice. I think oh, they live out wonderful. in Syracuse. And he's got a he's got a huge, huge race record. Yes, for sure. People don't realize just what kind of a race record that Ron Hall had. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very much so. One of the very best. He was uh, the only two-time winner of the Adirondack Cup. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, we're nearing the end of the Diane montage. Baker. Here. Yes. Wonderful oh, and on the lady. end there, on the end there, I just have to give a quick shout out. Uh, look let me, right there, on the on the right, that's my brother Brian. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. he yeah. came out last last year. Yeah. Yeah. So and he he thoroughly enjoyed it as well. He had a really good time. Yeah. Did he used to ride, Mike? Or? Yeah, he used to ride. He never neither of us ever raced, but we used to ride a lot. We as as kids. In the 70s, we had snowmobiles and did a lot of trail riding with friends right. and went to a few drag races and so forth. It's just yeah. small, informal things in town, but we have wonderful memories of that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, um, the smiles on those faces were for real, and uh, we hope that you will come and join us and be part of uh, the, the, the Smile Brigade. It's all free, too. Uh, let's not yes, forget it's all this. Free. There's no charge for you guys to come and, and watch uh, the legend of the sport be inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a free deal. Just bring a chair. Yes, bring, bring a chair. folding chair, it's and fair. there's going to be plenty of room in that mall. Come and sit and enjoy the day. And, yeah, mingle with these people. And that's what it's all about. Yes, and uh, they're very they're approachable. They're not going to be around forever. True. And they're very approachable. You know, just walk up to them, ask them for a photograph, ask, you know, ask them questions. Yeah. And, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's a great and and there's all you'll you'll be also hearing a lot of stories and tall tales from uh, yesteryear that's as right. well. Yeah. 
And they get, they, get, they get bigger every year. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's like the yeah, fish that get bigger cool. every year. Yeah, it's like a fish story. Yeah. Yes, there's some amazing stories going around. But I, I was really start, start struck by, you know, these big names that I'd read in magazines back when I was a kid. And, you know, and now to get a, get to meet them in the flesh and shake their hand, and they're like regular people. Yes. Uh, I, I did. I checked a couple of times, and their feet are actually touching the floor <laughs> like mine, you know. Yes. They actually, there's no air in between, so they they're not they're not walking on water. Yes, uh, they're they're an ordinary regular people, and they're just wonderful. They sure are, and there's going to be dozens of them there. Um, and there's time for everyone to to hang out and, and visit with them and have an image taken with them. Uh, it, it really is it's an incredible experience, and I know I keep saying this, but it's true. I think the the camaraderie of spending time with them to me, is just as much of an attraction as the ceremony. And the oh, ceremony is. is certainly wonderful. It's wonderful to yeah. see them being uh, uh, celebrated and, and recognized. That's a wonderful thing, but to be able to spend time with them. And also the inductees that have been inducted in the past, that they, they care enough about this to come see the next inductions yes. uh, because it was such a good time. Yes. Um, and they look forward to that sense of community, as do we. And it's it's oh, it's, it's a, what a, a wonderful experience. And, you know, back in the day when you were watching these people race, uh, back then they were untouchable as far as being able to walk up and talk to them because they're on the, in the pits on the infield. Mm -hmm. uh, most, most uh, uh, spectators weren't allowed on the infield. Uh, you know, you bought a special pit pass, I guess, or something like that, but it was a lot more money. So, you know, you stayed, you, you, you could watch and they had helmets on. It was hard to see their faces. And occasionally uh, one might walk by you but they're busy working on their sleds. They're, they're, they've got their mindset to, yeah. to win the race. They, they don't want to stop and, and do any small talk. They're, you know, all business. For sure. And so now here's your chance to actually meet these heroes that you used to see burn up the, the tracks back 50 years ago. Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to pop that banner one more time. Uh, what we're talking about here is the coming up this coming Saturday, two days from now, September the 9th, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, normally it's at Crane's Snowmobile Museum, but because we're expecting rain, we're going to have it at the Commercial Hall at the Lancaster Fairgrounds. Um, and I've got images of that. Everything's all set up and waiting for everyone to arrive. That's where the inductees are going to sit and their families. And uh, do bring folding chairs because that empty yeah. space you see will be filled with chairs that, that uh, you're bringing. Is that there's um, absolutely plenty of room. Yes, plenty of room. And here's another thing: the toilet is just to the uh, as you look facing this photo right now. Uh, the toilet is to the right, just uh, just outside a little ways, and and there's the toilet. So both nice, men yeah. and women separate. So so if we have to answer nature's call, it's just a few right. steps away. Right. Wonderful. So, yeah. And then I'm going to attempt to live stream it. I've never done it from that location. Not sure what to expect in the way of a signal. I'm hopeful, but I can't make any guarantees, but I am going to try and live stream it. So wherever you're viewing this now, if I'm able to do that successfully, you'll be able to view it uh, wherever you're watching this now at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So be sure and monitor wherever you're viewing here. And we've got a comment that's come in. Uh, here we go. Darren Lumby says, thank you guys for doing all the work to bring these shows to us. Great show. And I might be one of your biggest fans. In more ways than one, I love old sleds and food. Wonderful. Well, thank yeah. you, Darren. And yeah. and Darren, uh, every month uh, he he contributes. He makes a, a contribution to the uh, to the, the sorry the Vintage Snowmobile podcast, and yes. we thank him so very much with that. He's got that on an auto bill, and we thank that thank him for that. That helps to offset the costs of doing the, the Vintage Snowmobile podcast, and, and as well as the Muscle Car podcast. So, Darren, thank you so very very much for that. We appreciate that. And, and uh, it, please yeah. come because if you like old sleds, I, I'm not going to spill the beans, but we are going to have a visit of a, a full blown race sled uh, at some point. So uh, at the at the program, so wonderful. Uh, it's, a, it's a big it's a big surprise for somebody. Wonderful. So we have that to look forward to as well. And I think I know the one you're talking about. And that will be that will be worth the wait if it's the one I'm thinking, yeah. and if it's not the one I'm thinking, I'm sure it's equally as interesting and wonderful. <laughs> but uh, yeah. good, good. 
So, so yeah, and, and here's another thing that the it can be brought inside. So if it's raining, you, you know, you're going to be able to look at it, and it's going to be high and dry. And like I say, that thing is there's plenty of room under that building. It's got to be at least 80 feet wide, maybe 100 feet wide, and probably a couple hundred feet long. So plenty of room. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And if it, if it's the sled you were messaging me about last week, it, it's it'll be worth coming yeah. just for that alone. Yeah. 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 Good deal. Good deal. Yeah. I won't spill the beans on it either, but that will be <laughs> worth a look. Yeah. Well, cool. But come, um, so, but come uh, for the day. Uh, yeah. yeah. Spend. Uh, it's not going to be that. It's going to take the whole day. It's probably going to take a couple, three hours, to, hours yeah. to do the induction and everything. But uh, if it's going to be a rainy day or if it's going to be really hot, you're not going to want to be out in the sun and the heat, and you're not going to want to be, you know, out getting wet somewhere in a thunder shower. So come right underneath that uh, nice big barn roof that's. Uh, yeah, we got the doors will be open, so it'll be a little breeze coming through off the metal, and uh, I think it's going to be a pleasurable time for everybody. For sure. Yeah, plenty of room to mix and mingle, especially if it's raining. It'll all be yeah. under a big roof, plenty of space. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And we've got some T-shirts for sale uh, at the uh, apparel table. My wife is going to be there. Mm -hmm. And that's re basically where we get a lot of our income is from T-shirt sales. Yes. So, and DVD uh, and sales I, and too. I know that, I know be, yeah, the price. The thing is, I I'm uh, was so displeased with how much everything has gone up. But good gosh, we we bought a a uh, a medium sized pizza, two salads, and two drinks at Pizza Hut here a while ago, and it was fifty bucks with a tip. I mean, come on, crazy. Everything is crazy. But yeah. uh, you know, if you buy a T-shirt or a long sleeve. Uh, we're going to have the Hall of Fame emblem on the back, Crane Snowmobile Museum on the on the breast. And any time you wear that shirt, it shows that you are, have, are a supporter of the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame. That's what that yeah. shows every time you wear that shirt. So You're a proud supporter. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that uh, is and very and much appreciated. I think the T-shirt's now like 25 bucks. And the thing uh, wears like iron. I can tell you that you cannot wear these things out. Nice. They last nice. and last and last. They're very well made. So, nice. yeah. And I'm bringing some DVDs. I've DVDs. got DVDs of each of the induction ceremonies. This is going to be induction ceremony number seven. So I've got DVDs from all six ceremonies. So if you're wanting to buy yeah. one, they're ten dollars each. Uh, yeah. Also, I'm, we're going to be recording this and and. Uh, I do the cell phone live stream, but Greg also does a more professional version that I take that and edit that into a, a version that we'll be making a DVD of for the seventh ceremony. We'll be taking pre-orders for that. Now, right. those I have to have, re I hope to have ready by Halloween, but there'll be pre-orders that we're going to mail to you because it takes a little while to turn that around to edit that and yeah. put that on discs and everything. But uh, that will be an option. There's a sign. There will be a sign-up sheet for that. And then, of course, there's a project that you and I did last summer, the Time, Time Capsule, Capsule DVD. That will be available for sale as well. Did you want to do a quick mention on that so people know what that is? That Time Capsule is absolutely, if anybody's really interested in early snowmobile racing, this Time Capsule is, is, is something that you'd really have because it's at the 1971 Grand Prix. And by the way, the Lancaster Grand Prix in 1971 was voted as the best race track event in all of uh, Eastern USSA racing that year. They were voted the best racetrack. In, in, so you're going to see the Grand Prix at its height in this night. And you're going to see a bunch of four-cylinder King Cats that Mike was drooling over. And he even stopped action so that you could, you could just right. Google at them. And, and uh, like I told Mike on the DVD, these things are, they're only three months old. Yes, oh, they're they were brand new sled. Shining, <laughs> you know, yes. All of them, Polaris's, Skidoo's, all of the Yamahas, they're all brand new sleds out there racing. And uh, you're going to see a lot of people that you that passed away now. And uh, so uh, it's a 71 Grand Prix. And then uh, later you can see excerpts of the 1973 Malone, the World Series race at Malone on this uh, DVD. Yep. But uh, that time capsule is really something to have, I think. Yes, we had a blast making it. And, and yes. what it was is Midge's cousin, Andy Buto, had some 8 millimeter footage from both of those races that Midge was just talking about. Yeah. And 
he gave them to Midge and they were digitized. And Midge and I had been talking about, well, what can we do with this to make this into a presentation that people might enjoy? Yeah. So what we came up with is we rolled the footage and we, Midge and I were talking much like we are now. And we would pause the footage anytime there was someone of note or any kind yeah. of a situation. Uh, we we talk it up, whoever the person was, the situation was. We would talk that up, anything we knew about them or the situation. And, and for instance, uh, uh, Bruce Dunham's King Cat accident. We were able to freeze frame that, slow that down, yeah. look at it two or three times and watch frame by watch frame yeah. as that unfolds. Yeah. Um, we actually and, saw when he hit the, whatever he hit the post or whatever he hit on the, on the turn four, he went way high, struck something really hard. And the snow flew 20 feet in the air, and he came straight down across the track. Two seconds later, the thing was in for it, and uh, it was just sitting there on a big uh, pile of steam, and uh, it broke his uh, right front ski leg off. So, yeah, yeah that's uh, that's on there. That's and a he very stood up and walked effect. away, and he, he nearly was hit by another sled. He nearly was by. hit by a skidoo. Uh, he was a very uh, lucky man that day. Yeah, yeah. That's, you know, you can tell how dangerous that sport was. Yes. That's and that DVD was very dangerous. Yes. Now this DVD yeah. goes on for over two hours like that, where we're just looking at this eight millimeter footage and we're pausing it to talk about notable racers, notable organizers, anyone that we knew who they were uh, associated with the racing. We would talk them up and whatever yeah. backstory we had uh, to <laughs> offer, and we just went on for like like that for over two hours. Um, yeah, yeah. Bob we had a blast making it. There. Calvin Reynolds yeah. is on there. Bob Eastman yeah. is on there. Um, yeah, so yeah. a lot of big names. Yeah, and Midge and I had a blast Bob making Martin. it, and we think you'll have just as good a time viewing it. Oh, I I, I know they would, yeah. Yes, and that DVD um, will be available for sale uh, at the ceremony on Saturday. There'll be a table with all of the DVDs out, and those yeah. are the DVDs that will be available for sale to you. And, and, and any and DVD of that you of every one of those DVDs, go to the Hall of Fame yes, in the museum. exactly. Yeah, yeah, and the podcast. We divide it three ways. It's a yeah. fundraiser for all three entities, the, the Hall of Fame, the museum, and the podcast. Yes. And it's a wonderful fundraiser for all of us. Yes, really. Yeah. And Mike worked hard on this. You did a lot of editing, and uh, he actually slowed it up. I don't know how you did that, but because uh, everybody, if you're familiar with 8mm, it's almost like watching uh, a, a silent movie, Keystone Cop type thing. There, they're actually fat. The eight millimeter is a little faster than normal speed anyway. So it was really hard to see the sleds, but Mike will slow this thing up so that you can actually, actually count the number on the side of the sled as they go by. Yes. Uh, you, you did a phenomenal job on that, uh, Mike. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's something to have really. It is. We had so much fun making that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you'll the viewers will have just as much fun viewing it. Oh yeah, but, uh, and nobody nobody's called you that have I think we've sold like ten of those or something on uh, through the through the mail. Yeah, and I think everybody's been satisfied with it. Yes, I've had a lot of positive feedback on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. and I think I have 50, 12 or fifteen copies that I'm bringing Saturday, and it's, yeah. once they're gone, they're gone. You know. Yeah, that's right. But, um, so, so if you're curious about that, that, hit that table as quick as you can. You know, for the DVD. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much to show up for. There's, there's, there's that stuff. And, and then uh, the people that are being inducted and uh, there's a lot of hall of fame members that are going to be there that have already been inducted. That'll be in the crowd and they'll all have name plates, uh, little name tags. Uh, and the ones that have name tags are the big deal. They're the, they're the, they're the people that you're going to want to meet. So. Yes. Yes. Bring a, bring a camera, get some Kodak moments. With absolutely these, uh, these legendary yeah. racers yeah yeah and they, they'll they'll do that for you you can uh, stand yeah, very have a photo like taken that. with them if you got something for them to sign if you buy a t-shirt you want them to sign a t-shirt they'll gladly do that there's some sharpies kicking around there and uh yeah it's yeah, a good time good day. well cool so I, I think we're finished i think what i'll do now is i've got that interview that you and i did a few years ago where you talk about the origins of the Eastern Snowmobile Hall of Fame and how that all came to be. Uh, there's that interview, and then after that interview is a tour of Crane Snowmobile Museum. So um, any quick final thoughts uh, just, before we roll that footage? Or uh, Just come, rain or shine. Yes. We have plenty of room. It doesn't matter if it rains. You're going to be undercover, and uh, it's going to be a great day. For sure. 
Yeah, yeah. And thank you in advance for, for joining us, whether you're able to join us in person or watch the live stream. Thank you so very much for-, for And thank you, Mike, for doing all you're doing for us too. Oh, my uh, pleasure. Yeah, thank you for- Mike Puppy here. Well, thank you so much. I just can't. Yeah, he's. And he's, thank you for being the founder all of all of this. This is your brainchild. Uh, you know, you, you know, a guy can can holler, uh, you know, every, around for everybody. You know, you can think about stuff like that, but uh, uh, it, it, it's it's the people behind the scenes. I, I just thought of it. Uh, I'm the one that just thought of it. But uh, there's so many people that make this work. Yeah, it's um, taken on a life of its own. Yeah, yeah. I, I can. Uh, it, it takes somebody with more knowledge than I have, and Mike is one of them to help this thing work. So, yeah, I it really is the team Mike. that makes it work. Yeah. Thank you as well. Yeah, well, cool. Yeah, so let's roll that uh, interview and and yeah, thank you, Mitch. I look forward to catching up with you on Saturday. Okay. Yes. Uh, absolutely, Mike. Yeah. Right. Saturday morning when you show up, uh, we'll work on that sound system. So. Yes. Okay. Alrighty. Take care, everybody. Um, Good night. Stay tuned for this, this video. Take care. Okay. Click the link in the description for your free Amsoil catalog. Before we get started, I'd like to give a quick shout out to some of our friends. The Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame. Search for them on Facebook. Central Minnesota Pond Racing. Search for them on Facebook. The historic Lancaster Motel for the ultimate Eastern Trail Riding Adventure. Crane's Snowmobile Museum at 172 Main Street in Lancaster, New Hampshire. The Vintage Snowmobile Club of America Quarterly Magazine. The Bridge Street Garage Racing Team, the house racing team of the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast. The New Hampshire Snowmobile Museum at Bear Brook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire. And lastly, if you decide to advertise with the Vintage Snowmobile Podcast, this could be your advertising message. I'm on the phone with Midge Rosebrook. How are you doing, Midge? Good, Mike. How are you? Doing well, thank you. So, Midge, tell me, what is the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame? The Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame uh, is something Paul Crane and I started here in Lancaster. We uh, felt that there was a need to recognize the guys that used to race here in the East back uh, in what I would call the golden era. Uh, would be uh, from the mid-1960s to the uh, late 70s maybe early 80s, but mostly I think the meat of the golden era would be definitely the 1970s. Sure. And uh, it really, uh, racing here in the, in the eastern United States never really got covered. Those guys never really got uh, recognized like the Midwest guys did, uh, the factory drivers, you know, and the, and the big name distributors and things like that from the Midwest, they, they had these two Hall of Fames out there. Sure. And, uh, you know, they, they recognize their guys, and it's sad that uh, the Eastern guys never got recognized. And how this started was, and I can take you back to when we did the 50th reunion of the 
Lancaster Grand Prix in 2014. Uh -huh. The Grand Prix uh, started in in, uh, in in 1964 uh, as a side event uh, for the Winter Carnival when Lancaster was celebrating their 200th anniversary, and uh, it, it took off. Uh, and uh, thank you to Timberland Machines, uh, the big Skidoo distributor here in Lancaster. Um, it was uh, it was basically Bob Bottoms that that uh, allowed uh, his crew to help build the track. Roberts Motors stepped in. Uh, Butch and Johnny Roberts, they had a Skidoo dealership there. They helped. Uh, White Mountain Mac, there were several businesses in town that really stepped to forward and helped the snow drifters, the Lancaster snow drifters, uh, actually put the event on. But it uh, took, it was a town effort to put this uh, big race on. And at one time, the Lancaster Grand Prix was the largest outdoor winter event in New Hampshire. Wow. They were. Yeah, they they were pulling in uh, fifteen thousand fans. Fifteen thousand! Wow, that's a big yeah, crowd. They yeah uh, they they counted fifteen thousand fans for a couple of years there in the early to mid seventies uh, at the Lancaster Fairgrounds. Wow, that is and, impressive. Uh, with a half mile oval track, mm -hmm. uh, horse track. Horse track, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the Polaris was actually the first. Um, factory team to come here in 1966. Mm -hmm. Bob Eastman and Randy Heights came and raced uh, in 1966. That was absolutely that was also the first year for the Big Kilkenny Cup, which was donated by Timberland Machines to the Snow Drifters. Oh, no kidding! Yeah, and, yeah, and uh, our own Bill Buckland here from town uh, and Bobby Fortin. Uh, both got their names on that uh, big cup. They were the first two to to have their names engraved on the cup in '66. Nice. So yeah, and uh, the factory teams came here uh, during the '70s. There would be 10 or 12 fully equipped tractor trailers, 45, 50 foot boxes uh, of uh, the major you know, distributors and factory teams of the day back then. Mm -hmm. Arctic Cat came, Snowjet, Yamaha, Polaris, Skidoo, uh, uh, Mercury, just about every big manufacturer you could think of came here to race at Lancaster. Nice. It was really, it was quite something. And uh, then it, uh, the whole thing ended in New England around 1980. Around 80, okay. Or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys that were putting it on, you know, they were they were getting tired of uh, not getting enough volunteers to help. Uh, the insurance started getting more expensive because people were getting hurt. A couple people got killed. And so the insurance started to increase. Uh, it got costly. Sure. Uh, even though the Grand Prix moved down onto the meadows, uh, it got away from the telephone poles and the and the hazards of of what they what occurred at the fairgrounds. Uh, it was a, one of the most safe safest tracks uh, running back then, and everybody touted how great the track was. They they iced it down uh, in 1976. Uh, Gilles Villeneuve came here with that IFS rule. Oh yeah, in Clean House. Nice. Yeah, this was the first uh, that he made his debut here with that IFS rule at the Lancaster Grand Prix. Oh no, kidding! I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, nice. he made his uh, made his national debut, and in the stands watching that day was Bob Eastman from Polaris. He's the uh, he was the. Uh, team captain, if you will, Bob sure. Eastman, yeah. and uh, his teammate Wes Pesek was there watching, and this was in 1976, and they were so impressed with that, 
that uh, Bob went back to the factory. They raced at Bangor that next weekend. They went back to the factory. And uh, he called up a guy by the name of Gordon Rudolph, who had been himself dabbling with IFS sleds on his own. And he, he says to Gordon, he said they hired him to come help them set up a new Polaris racer for the next season. It turned out to be that RXL. Oh, yes, yeah, so with that suspension, that front yeah, suspension. And, uh, yeah. of course, we know that, you know, that cleaned house. Sure. And, uh, but in 1977, also, it was the last year of the Grand Prix. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, 77 was the last year of the Grand Prix. And uh, they raced in Bangor, you know, for a few years after that, and Scarborough. But basically, by 1980, 81, 82, racing dried up here in New England, and that was about it. Uh, and everybody went back to their day jobs, and and you know, it it was a it was a strange thing. Uh, I I can't think of anything, Mike. In these long pole New England winters, that was ever so as exciting and ever made as big an impact as did snowmobile racing back at its height. I agree. Yeah, I there, agree. There was not, there's nothing. Nothing since has been as exciting or as big or made as big an impact financially for these True. small towns. And there's nothing else I mean, that'll Lancaster, bring people. You know, it, there's nothing yeah. else that'll bring people, thousands and thousands of people, outside in the middle of winter to be spectators. Or no, something. nothing else is no, going to no. bring that kind of a crowd. No, no, and and to, and to bring uh, you know a, a dozen factory teams from the Midwest. Yeah. You know, to to send a, a team of five or six drivers, fully equipped tractor trailer trucks. Uh, I remember uh, Bob Clark was in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Bob Clark was uh, a multi Grand Prix chairman uh, during that era. And uh, he said one time, he said he thought it was 1970 or 71, they, they held up the races because uh, Team Arctic hadn't showed up yet. Well, well they got on to CB. Huh. And they located uh, the, the Team Arctic truck. And they said, where the heck are you? Yeah. And the driver says, I'm stuck. <laughs> and they said, stuck? Stuck where? He said, I'm stuck here at the intersection. He said, on your main street. He said, the traffic going to the track won't let me in. <laughs> he said, the traffic is backed up as far as I can see down Lancaster's main street, and then and nobody's letting me in. Wow. So they had to, they, yeah, they had to escort, they sent a cruiser down, a state police cruiser. Yeah. And he escorted Team Arctic's big truck up the left-hand side of the road from that triangle on the, on the end of Main Street there that splits Route 2 and Route 3. Yes. And uh, he escorted him up to the fairgrounds on the left-hand side of the road because the traffic was so heavy going in. That's amazing. That's a great story. It was, it was something. Yeah. Now, while we're talking so, about uh, this, um, I wonder if you could tell me, too, that Lancaster was obviously a massive location and experience for racing. But they were, yeah. how, were they, how were they doing that? Was there a circuit around New England where they would do Bangor one weekend and Boonville another weekend? And how, how were they structuring yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah, that's what they did. Of course, when they came out with the USFA, uh, and uh, they sanctioned, you know, the events. Uh, Lancaster was one of the one of the big boys, and uh, we started. Uh, our our uh, date was pretty much set in stone by the time USSA came out because we'd been racing here since 1962. Wow! And then, of course, they they called it the motorized toboggan races. <laughs> in 62 and 63 right. and then uh, they changed it to the Grand Prix to make it sound better I guess for the 200th birthday of Lancaster that year that's why they changed the name yeah and uh, <clears throat> so 
Yeah, Lancaster was on this circuit. Uh, Bangor would be, uh, I think Bangor was a weekend either before or after us, and then they did Scarborough, mm -hmm. they did Jackman. Jackman, I think, was the, probably one of the first races in the east here, Jackman, Maine. I think yeah. that happened like in December or something like that. And, uh, yeah, they had a race in Laconia, they had a race in Boonville, New York. And, uh, yeah, the guy, it was like a circuit. It was big time. That's cool. These guys were professionals. They were pulling fifteen hundred, two thousand, twenty five hundred dollars a week a weekend in. You know, to if uh, like Bobby Fortin uh, yeah. was uh, one of the big name drivers here in the East, and he, where I used to work at the golf station here in Lancaster, he always used to come in, and he'd have a check of a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars to win. Wow. Uh, plus, he'd get so much, he'd get a you know a couple hundred dollars from a spark plug company or or you know dry belt company. <sighs> yeah, these guys were professionals. That's cool. And uh, it was uh, it was an exciting time. Yeah, it really sure. was. Sure. And uh, so anyway, uh, when we decided to do a 50th reunion of the Grand Prix, a lot of the old guys that used to race back then came to the reunion and I even have a photo of a bunch of them lined you you've seen it at Paul Cranes yes those guys all lined up on the racetrack yeah and uh, they wanted they they had they got me in there and I, I kept telling them I said I didn't race I said I should not be in there well they, they begged me to get they, they made me go in so yeah. I mean uh, I shouldn't have been in that photo but I was yeah. Anyway, that's nice. It, it really it it got me to thinking. You know, it, it's sad that these guys never got recognized. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so I think that I think that planted a seed. Now, can you? And, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. And I think it did. And then in 2016, we had the national show here. Yeah. And uh, it packed the fairgrounds. You know, with a bunch of whole oh, beautiful vintage slats it just was an unbelievable show yeah it was i was there and, it was uh, an incredible show wasn't it great it, it was, was a great show and uh so there again here's conrad rollins tom peters uh bruce bruce dunham mm -hmm. bob martin all came back and uh you know they they were getting into it again so anyway, I, I said to Paul, I said, uh, the, I tell you who it was, it was a gentleman from, uh, I think it was the Hall of Fame from uh, St. Germain, Wisconsin was there uh, selling a <coughs> raffle sled. He was selling tickets for a raffle sled mm -hmm. for for that Hall of Fame. And, and uh, I had, before that, I had sent Bruce Dunham's, Bob Martin, and uh, Conrad Rollins resumes out there just to see what would happen i i uh wanted to see if maybe i could get one of those guys into the hall of fame out there so yeah. paul approached the guy and he was on the board of directors as well mm -hmm. so paul asked him uh, what he thought what his thoughts of uh, bruce dunham uh making it into the hall of fame that year and uh, look, he had a puzzled look on his face and he said hmm, bruce dunham Boy, he said, that doesn't ring a bell. He said, I, I know he's not in the top ten. Wow. And and Paul came to me, and, I, and, and Paul says, they're not, in, he says, they don't even know who Bruce Dunham was. Wow. He said, they're inducting 35 and 40-year-olds out there now. He said, they're, they're, you know, there's, there's no chance. Yeah. He said, we don't, they, we'll never get them in. He said, there's not a chance. So anyway, I went back home. I didn't sleep. Actually, I think I went up to camp up to Maidstone, and I rolled and tossed and turned all night. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I sat up and sh I said right out loud, I said, and my wife wasn't even with me or nobody. I was all alone. Yeah. And I said, that's it. That's it. And I could not wait. This was Saturday. I could not wait for Sunday morning to get a hold of Paul Crane. And, and and ask him 
you know, if I, I so anyway, about seven o'clock uh, Sunday morning, uh, I didn't want to get him too early, so I waited until seven. <laughs> so I grabbed the phone, I dialed Paul's number. Paul answered, and I says, "Paul, you're sitting down." And he says, "No." He said, "I I could." <laughs> I said, "What What are your thoughts on having our own Hall of Fame?" I said, "We could do it at your museum." Paul says, "Let's do it." Nice. Just like that. Wow. And that's how it started. And the ball has just continued and, to roll yeah, from there. And it's, it's continued to roll from there. We inducted our first uh, inaugural four people uh, into the Hall of Fame uh, in 2017. Uh, it was May 19th, I think, of 2017. Uh, we inducted our first four. And... Uh, and then the next year we inducted five, and then the next year we inducted five more, and in this last year we inducted seven. Nice. Now, can you tell me about some of these people who have been inducted, and also what qualifies someone to be inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame? You know what? Uh, you, you, you don't have to have a perfect record. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, uh, you know, when, when you say the Hall of Fame, the word fame means famous. Okay, that that's that's just a short for famous. Mm -hmm. It's a hall of the famous, really. Sure. And uh, Tom Peters. Let's, for an example, we just inducted Tom Peters this year. He's from Northern Maine, way up near the border of Canada. But Tom Peters was a hero to those guys up there. And uh, he never raced in any place but Maine. Hmm. Never went outside of the Maine borders. Yeah. And to those, to those people in those small little towns in northern Maine, there was no bigger name than Tom Peters. Wow. And... Uh, he was actually inducted into the Maine Motorsports Hall of Fame. Uh, the only snowmobile racer to, to be inducted into the Motorsports Hall of Fame. That's an honor, yeah. Yeah, it is. That's a high uh, honor. But, but, you, but I think they did that because he only raced in Maine. Yeah. So, did he have as big a record as Bruce Dunham? No. Did he have as big a record as Cal Reynolds or Bob Fortin? Right. No. But to those people in northern Maine, Tom Peters was the biggest name in sports right there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's the reason why Tom Peters is in the Hall of Fame. Nice. And I can pick out a few other people that may not have had perfect records, but they were they were big names here in the East. Mm -hmm. So uh, we try to give, uh, we tried not, you know, not everybody can make it into the Hall of Fame. I realize that. Everybody yeah. should realize that. Sure. But if you know, if you did something special, if you, if your name was was one of the big names in the East, even though you might not have had a, a huge record, mm -hmm. you got a good shot. Yeah, good shot of being recognized. And, uh, yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, we've got Bruce Dunham in there. Bob Martin is in there. Uh, Conrad Rollins, those are the first guys that we inducted. Mm -hmm. uh, Calvin Reynolds from Maine is in there. Uh, there's quite a few Mainers. Uh, we've got, of course, Tom Peters. I just mentioned Tom. Sure, Paul uh, Lamontang. We've got Paul Lamontang. Yeah. Paul was a big. He was big. Yeah. Uh, Paul was a rough racer, and uh, and then later he raced Chaparral, and then he raced uh, Mercury. Uh, Paul, the, the name Paul Lamontang was huge here in New England. Yeah. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, well, Joe Wilkinson from Massachusetts. We just inducted Joe. Uh, Louis Lund, we inducted Louis in uh, 2018. 2018, I think, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Louis uh, only raced uh, maybe three, four years. Uh, I think he got number nine bib one year, so he's top ten. Yeah. But what made Louis special 
he may not have had as big a record, maybe as Bob Fortin, but what made Louis special was he was the first person to drive an IFS sled. Oh, no kidding, yeah. Yeah, because he was racing for Harrington King in Randolph, Mass., in 1972, they were the Chaparral distributor. They flew Louie out to Colorado. Uh, Chaparral had a, a, a secret uh, race sled that they were working on out there. Yeah. And guess who he was working with? Huh. Bobby Unser. Oh, no kidding. Bobby Unser designed the first IFS suspension on a snowmobile in Louie was uh, was the uh, test driver for Bobby Unser. No kidding. So yeah, that's no Louis small. Lund, he was the very first person to drive an IFS sled. And what sled today doesn't have an IFS suspension? Yeah, that's standard today. Yeah. So that 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 in itself. That's huge. Is a, is a, is a reason why Louis Louis Lund needs to be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so uh, that's that's how we pick and choose. Uh, the folks that need to be there. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Now, what, uh, what, or I should say, when and where is the next induction ceremony going to be? Uh, the next induction ceremony is going to be September 11th, mm -hmm. which in itself is, uh, uh, you know, not a very nice date to maybe have it, but. Uh, it's the it's the weekend after the fair. Okay. And uh, we'll I'll probably say something you know about September 11th. And, yeah, to kind of honor that uh, solemn and, and solemn little, moment. Little something there, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, it seems to be the best date for us because uh, we're inducting a, a person from New York who uh, is is heavily into stock car racing, and his grandson. Uh, races stock cars and he's on the pit crew yeah and so that happens to be the only open weekend for them gotcha so in order to have him be able to attend the induction uh that's that's the weekend we had to pick sure sure yeah. and this is this is going to be at crane's museum in lancaster yes this will be at crane's museum and uh, it'll, we'll do another outside ceremony. That seemed to work really good. That was very nice. Hopefully it doesn't rain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, if it does, we'll try to do it Sunday probably. Yeah. Uh, as a rain day. But uh, hopefully, uh, usually the, by that time in the fall, we have really, really nice weather. Yeah. And I'd like to add, too, and, that uh, if anyone is planning to attend this from out of town, there's no other place to stay. Lancaster Motel. The Lancaster yeah. Motel, absolutely. There are good Absolutely. friends over there. Absolutely, the, they they they've stepped to the plate. They they are so all over this thing. Uh, the Lancaster Motel grew up with snowmobile racing. Uh, I believe that was built in 1956. Mm -hmm. It was built by Norman McLaughlin. Yeah. Uh, his daughter Sally married Mike Beatty, who is in the Hall of Fame at Riverside Speedway as a stock car racer. He was a well-known stock car racer here in New England back during the 60s and early 70s. Yeah. And Mike Beatty was a multi-Grand Prix chairman. Uh, so th there's a big, big history of the Lancaster Grand Prix tied to the snowmobile circuit racing. Yeah, and, and didn't they, they used uh, to have the award the ceremony home. at the Lancaster Motel? That's where they, that's where they had the award ceremonies during the original Grand Prix. Yeah, and that's I think a lot of the racers stayed there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, can you just imagine Mike bellying up to the bar with Bob Eastman or <laughs> Larry Coltham? That would be amazing. Uh, you know, or one of the Trap Brothers, or I mean, they they were all here. That's where they stayed. That would be amazing. This place is huge. Yeah. Uh, not not in size, but in history. Yeah, the history is rich. Yeah, very rich with the Lancaster Motel. So I think we probably will have to make that our official uh, site. I agree. For, for, the, for the Hall of Fame, 
the Lancaster Motel is the official place to stay. Yeah, for sure. There's no other. And uh, yeah, I and they fixed the rooms all up. The people that just purchased the motel uh, have done a tremendous job on the place. They've gone through every room. Uh, they put in all new Wi-Fi, new TVs, uh, refurbished every room. New so flooring, it's, uh, everything. It's, they, yeah. they brought it back up to to snuff, and uh, it's going to be uh, it's it's a great uh, asset. Yeah, to and the it's town just and, to this hall of fame. and it's just walking distance from the the ceremony. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's only a block away. Yeah, from Crane's Museum and the ceremony. Yeah, yeah. Now let me ask yeah. you this: um, each year that I attend this induction ceremony, the crowd gets bigger and bigger. So this is something that's growing, and the future is looking bright. What are you thinking? Yeah. Are plans for the future for the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame? What are you thinking about the future of this? Well, we're going to try to continue uh, adding more of the uh, original racing pioneers uh, that raced, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, they're getting older all the time. They're they're in their late seventies, mid late seventies, early eighties, and we'd like to get them, you know, here while they're still with us. Yes, the clock is ticking. That, that being said. Uh, when I uh, did Cal Reynolds uh, in 2018, we put uh, Cal on the wall, and he was huge back then. He was a skidoo racer, mm -hmm. and uh, he won about everything going. Yeah. And anyway, after the ceremony, uh, instead of going up for photos, instead of thinking about himself, Mike, I felt an arm across my shoulder, and it was Cal Reynolds whispering in my ear. Huh. He said, Midge, he said, Bob Fortin really needs to be up there. And I says, I, I know, Mike. I, uh, I says, I, I know, Cal. Uh, you know what, though? What we're thinking about doing is getting all the people up there that are with us first, and then we'll try to do the ones that have passed away uh, at a later date. And he shook his head and he said, Midge, he said, that Bob Eastman, that Bob Fort needs to be up there more sooner than later. Yeah. And uh, so I told Paul I, I, what, what Cal said. And um, Paul said, yeah, he said, what we probably should do is, is uh, induct four people that are with us and maybe one who's passed away each year yeah because you know what their families aren't getting any younger either that's true isn't it yeah you know good and point so in 20 in 2019 we had bob fortin's two sons michael and david uh attend and uh i asked cal i i emailed cal and i said calvin uh, would you please say a few good words about Bob Fortin because you raced against him. He, you know, he raced for Timberland Machines, and uh, he knew Bob very well. He said, certainly, he said, I'd, I'd love to do that. So I introduced Cal when we did Bob, and his two sons stood up there. It was quite moving. I remember and, uh, that. It was very touching. Yeah. So, yeah, Calvin did that for us, and we uh, we thanked him. And I, I know he's a busy man. You know, Cal's got several businesses over in Maine there that he that he has to attend. And so uh, I I said to him, I said, uh, well, when he said, uh, uh, yeah, he said I would do. Bob Fortin for you guys and, and, and say a few good words about him. Yeah. And I said, uh, well, I'm, I'm just pleased that you could do this just, just one more time for us, Cal. I know you're busy. He said, Midge, let me tell you something. He said, as long as me and my wife, Mary Ann, are able, we will be attending every single 
Hall of Fame induction that you're going to hold here from now on. Nice. And he's true to his word. I've so seen him at every one. Yeah, yeah. And he spoke this year at uh, Ted Why Not. Ted Why Not, of course, was uh, the flagman for those guys for yes. years and years. He was also a Yamaha representative, and Cal sold Yamaha over there in Maine. So, yeah. you know, Ted was over there a lot, and uh, he was a good, good friend of Cal's. And uh, So Cal spoke a, a few nice words about Teddy. This that year was nice, too, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So, any final words, Mitch, uh, before we close this interview? Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to add yeah, about the uh, Hall of Fame? Well, uh, I just want to tell you folks uh, how much we appreciate Mike LaPierre here that's interviewing me. Uh, Mike has gone overboard for us, and I just have to put that in. I appreciate that. Uh, we really, we really appreciate everything you do, Mike. Well, you're very and, welcome. Uh, as far as this Hall of Fame, we're, we hope to continue this down the road, and we hope to get uh, as many of our original pioneer racers who who, who were big names back then on the wall at Paul Crane's museum, and. Uh, that's that's basically where we're at, and uh, these inductions are free. Uh, anybody can attend. Uh, bring a lawn chair, and and join us. If uh, if you are my age, I'm going to be 70 in March. If if anybody out there remembers those events the way I did, and stood out in the cold for three hours. <laughs> or four hours watching those guys race. If you can remember the exciting time that was, then this is for you. Yeah, because reliving you the get golden to hear age. These guys on, you get to shake their hand, you get to you get to talk to them, and you get to see these guys be recognized. That uh, that you know, it was just an event that will never come back again. We'll never ever see anything that exciting again. And uh, if you want to relive those moments just one more time, please join us. And the next event is September 11th, 2021, at Paul Crane Snowmobile Museum in Lancaster. Yeah. And I'd like to add to that to what you just said. Right now is the golden age of, of celebrating the golden age of snowmobiling. Exactly. It exactly. truly is. And, uh, yeah, I'd like yeah. to invite everyone who's within driving distance to, to come on come on by and, yeah. and uh, enjoy it with us it grows stay it gets bigger every year it's a it's a wonderful thing yes yeah, stay at the lancaster motel yeah yeah and and then come by to the after party at the lancaster motel as well that's it's yeah, a wonderful yeah, time they have an after party at the motel <laughs> i mean <laughs> you know back years ago during the grand prix i told these guys i said you race uh handlebar to handlebar all day long and stand elbow to elbow at the bars all night. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it was. They used to they used to pull the edges off because <clears throat> you know these these guys <laughs> these guys are crazy. They used to pull the engines off their sleds and take them inside the motel room and rebuild them <laughs> for the next day's race. Nice. And that's yeah, one of the, that's yeah. one of the remarkable things too about racing is they can be so. Um, ruthlessly competitive out on the track but after the race is yeah. over they party together and they have a good time and they laugh about it yeah it's it's, an, it's incredibly yeah. ironic but it's 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 a wonderful thing about racing is that that the relationships yeah. Yeah, are more really. important than than anything it's it's a wonderful yeah, thing know, they they made lifelong friends mike yeah you know these these guys uh when you when you, their eyes light up the minute they see an old competitor yeah uh, you know that they haven't seen for forty years. You know. Yeah, and to watch them reminisce, uh, it's a truly special thing. They're, yeah, they they're in, they're in heaven when they're doing it. They love it. Go it's, ahead. I'm sorry. It's more like a family reunion. It is. Yeah. And to hear all those old stories, and because they can recall like a specific moment on some turn in the track during a race where things were happening, and 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 kind of relive yeah. that, and it's it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Or, 
or uh, laugh because you know about uh, an incident that uh, some guy pushed them off the track yeah. when they're in the lead you know and, uh, and you know they say oh, you push me off the track you push me over the bank or something like that and yeah. then they laugh about it they yeah. probably weren't laughing at the time but no yeah yeah you know this is only gonna this is only gonna be a small window here too it's true the clock because is ticking for all of are, us like i just said they're 75 80 years old, 85 years old, and they're not going to be around forever. Yeah. Yeah, the clock is taking so on all of this. We've got a small window here to enjoy these guys. Yeah, to really do to, something with this. to uh, appreciate these guys. Yeah. And women. Yes. Yeah, there are some uh, truly remarkable so, women in this, this racing as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Judy Rinaldi. Yes. And World Series. That's incredible. She won 10 World Series. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, not not no man no man has ever done that before. So, uh, you know, she's uh, I mean, there's there's nobody <laughs> nobody close. No, uh, unbelievable. And, and uh, the nice thing about her too is to think about someone so accomplished, but to 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 visit with her, she's just the easiest person to talk to and the most relatable, personable person. Uh, very oh, yeah. down to earth, just a classy, classy lady. It's, uh, and, oh, yeah. and I could say the very same of the rest of them as well, you know, for all of yeah. their accomplishments, they're, they're very that? down to earth. Yeah. Those are the nicest people. It's true. Yeah. They're no really egos, like just very approachable. Nice yeah. yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. They all are. It's true. Yeah. No, uh, Paul Montang. I mean, uh, who, who wouldn't want to party with Paul Montang? <laughs> yes. He is the best he guy to hang out with. He's a lucky guy. Yeah, he's a lot of fun to visit with. He, he's a lot of fun. He really is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, good, good. Well, I appreciate your time with us, uh, uh, Mitch. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll close it out. But uh, I really appreciate your time. And, and we'll have more interviews on this topic, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All righty. I've got more tales to tell. Well, good. We'll look forward to it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks for my, thanks for this. Today Mike. on VintageSnowmobileLovers.com, we're in Lancaster, New Hampshire, at Crane's Snowmobile Museum, and our good friends Mitch, Midge Rosebrook and Paul Crane are just about to give us a tour of the museum. How you doing, guys? Good, good. Good. Before we get started, Paul is the first person in the U.S. ever to ride a snowmobile. Do I understand that correctly? A, mo a skidoo. A skidoo. Okay. A skidoo only. I skidoo. wasn't the first to ride a snow machine. The first one to ride a skidoo. Nice. American and first American to ride a skidoo. Nice. In Canada and here. Excellent. Not many people can lay claim to that. I don't believe so. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> awesome. start down this this row here all right uh, everybody can understand what the uh, just by looking at them what they are so we'll go down this row here first and then we'll On the end wall here, we have some some of the clothing. Most of them are practically mine and the family that wore that road things. Nice. Right, so these are yours from back in the day, you a and lot, your family. A lot of them are. <coughs> I would say that eighty percent of them are. Nice. And at the end here is a Scatmobile, which is rare. It's got three real big bloom tires. It's made, it was made out in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I met the guy years ago, and 
he was driving a Stanley steamer up his driveway and I told him I just picked one of those up and I'm going to start a museum someday and he said I'm going to give you something young man something that nobody has my first sign that was put on the factory and it's a plywood sign it's a little rough but I was going to cut the bottom part off where it's rotten but I just figured it would lose the value of it yeah for sure yeah Wow, that is awesome. That's quite a gift to receive. Yeah. Outstanding. Cool. Then I got patches on the back wall. Oh, yes, yeah. Patches on the back wall. Yeah. And Let's see if I can get in a little closer on that one. And up on the rack over here, we got some of the small snow machines. I remember the kitty cat from back in the day. Yeah. Then we got the 1926 Model T snowmobile, which is a foot narrower than the average snowmobile. And if you look at the running board, it says snowmobile right on it. Really? Which is rare. Right here on the step. Wow. And what year was this, Paul? You said 1920 something? 1926 as the plate. Oh, yes, yeah. Wow. I usually give rides when the snow's deep. I haven't done it this year yet, but I will be. Nice. And then some more mini sleds up top. Nice. And then these are some of the early mass-produced ski This is a 61 ski do with the wooden skis. This is a 61 ski do with the replaceable steel skis because the wooden ones we'd go out in the field and we'd break them. Huh. Wow. Now that first sled that you rode was it similar to this one or just like that. just like this one? Yeah. Wow. But it was a 1960. 1960, okay. I have one, but I haven't got it over here yet. Okay. Really? Yeah. Wow. That one has got 200 and something miles on it. Unreal. That's a nice shape. And I think they stopped making those in what, 2005 or something? They stopped. The Elite? 2004 and 5, I think they made a silver one. Yeah. yeah. A much more modern looking one. Yeah. Was that the last year, do you know? Yeah. It was, it was okay. I like that TNT. The old silver. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, I see a, a shift lever on that. Did that have reverse? Yes, reverse. Yeah. Nice. And did it have like a low gear for? No, it's yeah, just the regular. Just the reverse? Yeah. Okay. But it's, it's mint. It's only got 200 and something miles on it. Nice. A buddy of mine growing up had a silver bullet like that. Then we have the 64 tin cab motor ski. Wow. Which they didn't make very many of them. Then a 65 motor ski. Then the racing motor ski, which is a 64 her. And then this pier was a 500 racing sled. 
Okay. Apparently, so I've been told, the factory had it, yeah. Motor ski factory had it. Wow. That's cool. And then the Zephyr, which is all original. Wow, 1970, yeah. I remember these Nuvix back in the day. Yeah. My father's friend had one just like that. Then a pink motor ski was made from a friend of mine for his daughter. Wow. That is cool. You don't see those every day. No. It's got some ski spreaders on there too. Yeah. Keep it stable. His daughter wanted it pink. Nice. And this here is a rare 340 motor ski bullet. Wow. And the 340 Sonic, Supersonic, Semper Pro, Pro Sled. Then the Racing Northway. They may, only made 21 of them. 21, 21 wow. Sleds. Yeah. That's a real big hood. Does that mean there's a real big engine underneath? Or? It's a 440. 440, yeah. yeah. Nice, nice racing cat. Got a 76 Snow Pro. Nice. Yeah. That's one of the cooler looking sleds ever to be on the snow, I think. Yeah. And then the Husky. Yes, yeah. Of course, the RV. It's a new RV that they raced in 75. Nice, those were awesome. The snow cruiser, which was a repeat of 500, which, as far as I know, there's only four of those in existence. Four of those, wow, that's amazing. There's one in uh, the Brunswick, I understand. I've seen that one, and I understand there's one up in Peterborough where they came from. And I don't know if the one's still in New Jersey or not, but there was one down there. Nice. We had one like this when I was a kid. It was the consumer model, though, not the Starfire. That was fast. Even the consumer model, the 250, was really fast. Oh, yeah. Hello, everyone. This is Rob and Mike. How are you doing today, Rob? I'm doing good. Mike, yourself? Very well. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Now, uh, today, we're going to be talking about AMSOIL. And uh, in a few moments, we're going to show you how you can get the deepest discounts, free shipping, and free gifts when you order your AMSOIL products through us. But first, I'm going to ask Rob to give you a quick description of what AMSOIL is and why you should consider using AMSOIL products in your motorized vehicles. Thanks, Mike. AMSOIL is 100% synthetic oil. Everybody uses AMSOIL for a different reason. Some people like the benefits that AMSOIL is warrantied for 25,000 miles or one year. The reason we can do that is because AMSOIL doesn't oxidize. It doesn't form the usual carbons, gum, sludges like petroleum oils do. That's why we can keep it in the engines longer. Petroleum oils never do wear out. They oxidize themselves. That's why they have to be changed at 3,000 kilometers. And AMSOIL likes the benefit that you only have to change the oil once a year. That saves some money. Some of the people like the benefit of AMSOIL is it's a slipperier type lube. By having a slipperier type lube, it cuts down friction drag. By less friction and drag, engines run 20 to 50 degrees cooler, better gas mileage. Now, AMSOIL says 25% more protection than the industry requires is in the AMSOIL bottles. My average customer gets about 10% increase in gas mileage. That's a big savings. Yeah. And by cutting down friction and drag, for every 10 degrees you cut down the friction and drag, doubles the life of the engine. So by having the engine run cooler, it makes it last longer. Some people like the benefit of the range of the AMSOIL. AMSOIL's flash point is 425 degrees, and it pours at 50 below zero. Wow. If you ever try petroleum oil when it's 10 below, it turns to the honey. And yep. in the summertime, petroleum oil thins out, and once it, once it thins out, that's when it starts breaking down. So AMSOIL's an all-season oil, can give you better gas mileage, longer engine life, less maintenance. It ends up being cheaper over a year's time running AMSOIL than it is petroleum oils. That's amazing, that's amazing. 
and AMS oil is, is available for pretty much any motorized vehicle, uh, any from, anything from lawn equipment, cars, trucks, boats, ATVs, motorcycles, snowmobiles. Yep, yep. And a lot of people phone me up and say, well, what's the benefit of our gear loop? Exactly what I told you about the engine oil. It pours in cold weather, it runs cooler, makes the equipment last longer. And they say, well, what's the benefit of the small engine? Same thing, makes the engine run cooler, last longer, better performance. So it saves on all the applications that AMSOIL has available. Wonderful, wonderful. So yeah, let's uh, let's talk now. Uh, hopefully this has convinced people uh, to think about maybe joining us in the AMSOIL experience. Let's talk about some of the discounts and free shipping and how that all happens. I'm going to pop a, a graphic on the screen. And uh, yeah, by all means, if you want to talk talk people through how this preferred customer program works. Amsoil has a number of different programs. One of our main ones is a catalog customer where somebody can order directly out of our catalog. If they order out of the catalog, they order $100 worth, Amsoil ship it right to their house. But our best program is our preferred customer. For only $10 for six months, you become a preferred customer, you save 25% on all the product. You order $100 worth, they're gonna give you free shipping. Um, you don't have to order a whole case. You can mix and match. Say you want four bottles of small engine, seven bottles of 5W30, and a couple of gear loops. You can mix and match. You can order one bottle at a time if you want. There's no minimums, no maximums. By being a preferred customer, you save over 25% on all the products you're going to buy. Amsoil sends you extra gifts, uh, a $5 gift certificate on your birthday, $5 when you renew, renew your account, and stuff like that. So it's a good way to save on some of the products you want to buy. For sure, for sure. Yeah, it's an incredible value. And this is the, the deepest level of discount that anyone can get when ordering Amsoil. Is that correct? It is. It is. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's take people through the the step-by-step -step experience of, of placing an Amsoil order. Then that would include signing up for the preferred customer discount, or sorry, preferred customer program so they can receive those deepest levels of discount. So let's go to the website. This is what the website's going to look at look like. These are some screenshots. If you once you go to amsoil.com, there's a link in the description, or you can just type that into a browser, amsoil.com. This is the page you land on at the upper corner of the page. There, you see how I've circled in red. That is the link to click the join now link that will take you to the preferred customer program page where you can take advantage of all of these discounts and free shipping and everything that we've just been talking about. This is what that page looks like. In the lower right, you're going to click join now. This will pop up. You select the duration you'd like, whether it's six months or 12 months, and click add to cart. Now, once this, this uh, pop-up goes away, you'll be back on the main page. And the upper left, you'll see where I've got that red arrow. It says shop. Now you can start shopping for products. And on your very first order, you're going to get these discounts and the free shipping as long as it's over $100. You'll get all of these benefits right away. So once you click shop, it's going to take you to uh, some product the product page. There's different types of oils, lubricants, so on and so forth. For the benefit of this exercise we're doing now, I'm just going to click motor oil. It shows different types of motor oil. Let's click gasoline. Now, this takes us to an item. It's uh, their synthetic motor oil. And you can see the item there, and there's choices for different viscosities. But take a look at the price. Let's take a closer look. Let's zoom in. Uh, but if you've joined the preferred customer program first, you're going to automatically get the deepest levels of discount. That's what we're looking at here. You're saving $3.80 on that quart of oil. Instead of paying $16.29, you're now paying, paying $12.49 for that quart of oil. That is the deepest level of discount you can possibly get. And then uh, you just add the, the, the quantity that you'd like. You select any other items that you're thinking about, add them to the cart. And once you uh, click add to cart for the final time, you're going to see this come up at the top of the screen. It's going to show your items and your your um, the total that you're at so far. <coughs> Pardon me. And then uh, you just click view cart in the upper right, and that'll take you to your cart. Uh, take a close look here at the upper right. That blue box shows that you're getting free shipping. You're eligible for free shipping on this order because it's over $100. That little yellow box shows that you've got the preferred customer membership on your order that gives you the deepest levels of discounts for the next six to 12 months. And then below that, you've got the, the items that have been selected. I just, for the exercise here, I selected nine quarts of this signature series, but that brings us up over $100 for the free shipping. We're saving $34.20. $34 and if you're ready to, to finish, you click check out now, and that takes you uh, to this screen here. If you haven't signed up with an Amsoil account at this point, just click in the lower right to create an account, create a new account. It's going to ask you for some basic information, uh, name, and those types of things. Now, let's take a closer look. You'll see this gray shaded box. This is a very important box. This is going to ask you if someone has referred you to Amsoil. And if so, please enter my name. My name is Mike Lapierre. It's spelled right there on the screen for the correct spelling. And also the referral number, 304-555-94. That's how um, you make sure that Rob and I get credit for this. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I have signed up for Amsoil under Rob. So when you order using this referral number, Rob and I both benefit. 
So if you enjoy these podcasts that we're doing, this is a wonderful way to support the podcast because when you order uh, using this referral number, Rob and I both benefit. And the commissions I make go directly toward offsetting the cost of doing this pod these podcasts. So I thank you in advance for that, for using my referral number. I very much appreciate it. Uh, and once you've done that, you just go into the next screen to enter your payment information and you're done. Now, once you've entered, once you've placed your order that's over $100, uh, and that, that order includes your AMSOIL Preferred Customer Program, you are now eligible to get a free DVD from myself. Now, this is going to be either a muscle car DVD or a vintage snowmobile DVD. Uh, use the email address on the screen, wkspodcasts at gmail.com. Send me an email. Let me know which email. I'm sorry. Let me know which DVD you would like me to send you, the muscle car or the uh, uh, vintage snowmobile DVD, and I'll get that right out to you. As you're typing in that that email in the subject line, be sure and type in capital letters, free DVD requests. So it stands out as I'm checking my email and we'll get that right out to you. So I guess the last thing, Rob, that we wanted to talk about is uh, if someone is considering Amsoil as a business opportunity. Um, yeah. Yes, if anybody has a retail or a commercial account and they would like to buy directly from Amsoil, just send Mike a line. He'll show you how to set up and you can buy directly from Amsoil. But if you are interested in starting your own part-time business, a part-time business that can grow into a full-time income, Mike and I will show you the Amzo marketing plan. Amzo has a large selection of products that cover almost every application. So it doesn't matter if you're into snowmobile, boating, or ATV in or, or hot rods, we have an oil for every application. It's a fun type business that I really enjoy doing. Where else can I go and have fun and make money doing it? And Mike and I are here to help you all the way along if you need any help on how to promote or or to find new accounts, we're here to help you. For sure, for sure. So when you sign up under that uh, that number, this 304-555-94, you're getting Rob and I as a team. Now, Rob has been doing Amzo for 40 years. Can you believe that? 40 years. So he knows every aspect of this business and he knows all of the ins and outs of the products. So he'll be able to help you with any kind of product questions or any kind of questions to show you the different business models that you can do with Amsoil. And then the other thing that you get when you sign up under me is I've got a strong background in social media. So if you need some coaching on how to generate Amsoil leads using Facebook and YouTube, I'm happy to coach you with that when you sign up under Rob and I. Uh, you get both of us as a team uh, to help you, to coach you, to support you, whatever you need to get you, get you off and running with this business and having fun with it. It's like Rob said, it's enorm an enormous amount of fun. If you're like Rob and I and you enjoy going to any kind of you know boat shows, car shows, motorcycle shows, snowmobile shows, anything with a motor, you like going to those shows, those events, those races, this is a great way to turn that into a, 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 a income opportunity for you. Yes, yes. And just by wearing my AMZO hat at one of these events, people come up and ask me about AMZO. People, people don't know where to buy it, and I'm there to help them, show them where they can buy the product. Perfect, perfect. Well, cool, cool. Well, this is great. Uh, any final thoughts, Rob, before we wrap it up? AMZO is a fun business. AMZO has been around since 1968. You know, it was the first synthetic oil to be AI approved. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And that's very early in the game, too, isn't it? Yes. For sure. Well, good. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for viewing. Hopefully, we've gotten you excited, as excited as we are about the Amsoil products. We'd love it if you could enjoy, if you could join us either uh, as someone who uses the Amsoil products or to join the Amsoil team uh, as a business opportunity. And we thank you so much for viewing. Have okay. a great day. You have a good day.